One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it. Stick it out of it. So, all right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. Welcome to this edition of the business side of music. This is your host, Bob Bender. Today on the show... Uh, today on the show, we have Michael Shanley. He's vice president and head of business development at Music Reports. Uh, has over f- more than 15 years of experience implementing enterprise-level software solutions in the music and intellectual property rights business sector. Currently leading the development of Song Dex, which we're going to talk about on the show, the world's largest independent relationable database of music copyright and business information which is really one of the the big topics of discussion we have these days with with songwriters especially so i think it's going to really put the spotlight on on a lot of hopefully some answers to a lot of questions that we have prior to music reports michael ran a consulting company focusing on the physical distribution ecosystems he attended the university of albany S-U-N-Y, and has been a longtime music lover and guitarist. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you, Bob. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. So I got to tell you, I, I go to your website, musicreports.com, and the very first thing you know that you see when you pull it up is it uh, talks about innovating ways to empower the music community. Obviously, the music business, and, and especially from a songwriter's perspective and a publishing perspective, has changed so much over the last 10 years, even probably even more recently in the last four or five, uh, especially with streaming taking precedence over downloading. Uh, where does your company fit in on all this? Yeah, so generally, just to take a step back, Music Reports is a data and technology company. Uh, we provide high-volume rights-related solutions to large owners and users of intellectual property rights, period. So that extends beyond music, but we focus mainly on music because the challenge is there are very robust and much more challenging than the other intellectual property rights spaces. We were formed in 1995 to help the television broadcast community license an account on a granular basis for all the music they used in local programming. So that was a new service. We invented that service. uh, And it was the first time that creators actually got accounted to directly for use in audiovisual programming. Uh, you know, out of that process, the Songdex database was born, and like you said, it's the largest independent database of copyright ownership information in the world. And also, QTrack was born out of that process, which is the largest database of cue sheet information. Now, a cue sheet is an itinerary of all the music used in an audiovisual program, right? And so, we generate about a million of those a year, and of course, much more than that in the form of copyright ownership information. So at this point, uh, besides providing services to that television broadcast community still, we've evolved our services to uh, provide solutions to OTT platforms. So those are the streaming audiovisual services like Netflix, and then also the big DSP community, DSP standing for digital service providers, the Amazon Primes, the Pandoras, the iHearts of the world. Uh, And we sit in between them and the owners of copyright. We help them license at high volumes because they have hundreds of millions of sound recordings on their platforms. And of course, at this point in time, many tens of thousands of sound recordings are being released on a daily basis. So it's a significant challenge for anyone to wrap their arms around getting all the data related to not just the sound recording releases, but also the music publishing rights and the composition rights embodied in those sound recordings. So generally, we fit in between large users and large owners of rights, providing them both services on both sides. Uh, helping the DSP community, like I said, identify those composition rights embodied in those sound recordings that they're making available, and then also reporting to those music publishers, and then also helping music publishers, creators, indie record labels, curate their own metadata, understand their rights ecosystem, uh, and distributing and paying for all the royalties. Uh, At this point, 
you know, we're tracking tens of billions of transactions on a monthly basis and directing hundreds of millions of dollars in royalties on an annual basis. And you said tens of billions with a B, correct? That's right. It's actually tens of billions on a weekly basis. And the volume wow. of sound recording releases and usages is just really, you know, escalating. And like you said, the business has really evolved over the past 20 years, moving from a traditional retail product release based business where pretty much you'd go to a store and you'd buy a retail product, which was a CD, to this online subscription based model where you could listen to pretty much whatever you want at any time. You know, it also the, the evolution has been driven also by tools that are available to creators themselves, right? So historically, if you wanted to make a professional sounding sound recording, uh, it was a lot of trouble and it cost a lot of money. Now with all the tools that are available, it's very cost effective to make a very professional sounding sound recording and really anybody could be a record label and anybody could release sound recordings. And so at this point, there's about 30,000 new sound recordings hitting each of the digital services on a daily basis. That's pretty much more sound recordings on a daily basis than on a yearly basis in the 90s and before that. Uh, and on a quarterly basis, the music industry sees you know, more commercial releases than in all of the 20th century. And and when you say 30,000 pieces on a daily basis, that's individual songs, I that's take That's correct, it. yes. Where, you know, back in the 90s, in the early 2000s, when record labels were still releasing CDs, physical product into the stores, you know, it was maybe four or 500 new pieces a week. And, and that was from all aspects and all genres. So the business model has changed. Obviously, what what your company is doing is really taking a look of, I guess, for lack of better terms, the entire piece of the pie, or I should say the entire pie, uh, not just slices of it, because, you know, with the business model changing and we're now focusing on d different platforms, you know, you mentioned Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime, and of course we have Spotify and, and Pandora, those platforms, it really... I, I think, you know, and, and let me say this, we're now also focusing on something we didn't really think of even 10 years ago, and that was the independent artist, the, the, the DIY artist, the one who doesn't need the label or doesn't want the label, who's out there creating their, their embodiment of music and getting it out there on different platforms. They, they're facing some challenges that really the record labels have in sync. Would that be correct? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and I think there's, there's additional challenges that face the DIY community. Creating a sound recording and finding a partner, a technological partner, to release that sound recording. And there's a lot of technological partners for the DIY community to get that sound recording to the Spotify's of the world, to iTunes and iHeart and Pandora. Uh, but what there isn't is a team of folks that would have normally existed at a record label to help you license the composition, understand the rights related to the compositions, chase down royalties for you uh, for all various types of rights. So when you have a single stream on Spotify, for example, there's generally four types of rights that are invoked. You have the reproduction of your sound recording. You have your, um, your public performance of your sound recording. You have your reproduction of your composition. So that's the actual song, the writing, the words, the lyrics. And then you also have your public performance of your composition. Now, a lot of DIY artists uh, really aren't familiar with these terms. The whole ecosystem is a little bit mysterious to them, as it should be, because they don't have this big team of folks that would help them through these challenges like a record label would. And so, you know, Music Reports and other folks out there uh, really try hard to educate that community and provide them tools to, to make it a lot easier for them. Let me back up just a little bit here. How did you get started in all this? Well, me personally, uh, I, you know, I'm a lifelong musician. I started playing piano at, at the age of four, uh, then moved on to guitar and bass and drums and, uh, you know, was in various bands throughout my life. But my background's in software development and computer science and started developing systems in the physical distribution space, like you said. So that's global logistics, maritime transport and trucking transport and air transport. And, you know, moved out to Los Angeles and was going to do the same old thing, consulting, and I found a company trying to solve these challenges for the television business. 
uh, and the budding streaming business at that time, around 2003, these digital services were really just starting, right? So Napster had existed in the late 90s, but it was an illegal service, not licensing the music. Music Reports was part of the team that legalized that by providing software solutions uh, to license that music at high volume. So when I was, you know, looking for things to do here in LA, I found Music Reports. I was highly interested in in the work that they were doing and of course it hit home for me as a musician i had no idea that this ecosystem even existed and i think that's the same challenge that faces the diy community now uh, to really peel back the onion and realize the various types of rights that touch your work that you invoke when you record music and so you know i was very compelled and uh, i've been here ever since we said this once before but the landscape has changed you know we're not and I'm not taking anything away from the, the record labels and the artists that are signed to that. I have a tendency to do that on, on a lot of other podcasts. But today, the, the focus, you know, especially with the independent, the DIY artists and their role in, in the digital music landscape, they because music is not selling uh, from a monetary value like it was, say, you know, even five years ago, because we're not selling downloads. We're definitely not selling CDs, uh, at least not in, in the capacity of the level we used to be. That landscape has changed. So the DIY artists, the, the independent artists, they need to really discover what their role is and what it needs to be. That's right. And of course, you know, th there is a great value to record labels and, you know, the professionally produced content that's out there. Those folks have, you know, a great privilege of working with teams of folks that understand these th this ecosystem. But at this point, you know, the growth of the music business from a volume perspective is really driven by indies and DIY creators. Uh, and, and actually on a monthly basis, less than 10 percent of all releases come from those traditional labels. And, you know, the remaining 90 percent is from the DIY creators and and indie artists themselves. Do you think the the independent artist can be successful in using this model from a from a financial standpoint? Uh, absolutely. And I think there's great examples of indie artists right now that represent their own rights that went at it in a very professional way that were informed and used tools that were out there to help them for low cost. Uh, you know, great example is Chance the Rapper is not on a traditional label, very famous, and certainly monetizing his creations on a, on a high level. We're going to take a break, but when we come back, there's a couple other things I want to touch on. You know, what tools are out there for the DIY artists, I think, is is really important. Uh, obviously, you know, your company, Music Reports, Soundex, those are tools that these artists, especially the independent artists, need to really become introduced to and educated on so they can use it to their best benefits. Uh, today on the show is Michael Shanley, who is the VP and head of business development for Music Reports. And we're going to dig in a little deeper about their company and the services they can provide today's artists. Hey, this is Paul Aldrich, and you're listening to the business side of music. You're listening to the business side of music. Hi, this is Vinny Rebus, the founder of Indie Connect. Our goal is to ensure that you have the knowledge, the tools, skills, resources, and connections that you need to develop a profitable and long-lasting career in music. One way we do this is through these Business Side of Music podcasts. I'd also like to invite you to check out Indie Connect magazine, our free multimedia online publication packed with practical interviews and advice from music industry experts. Go to www.indieconnectmag.com. That's www.indieconnectmag.com. Let us walk with you and guide you every step of your musical journey. You're listening to the business side of music. This is Bob Bender in the studio today with Michael Shanley, who's the vice president and head of business development at Music Reports. Uh, definitely, if you are a, a songwriter, if you are an independent artist, you need to check these guys out at their website, which is www.musicreports.com. And we'll definitely have all of their contact information at the end of the show, like we always do. You know, Michael, I, we talked about this briefly before we went on the break. What tools are out there for that independent artist uh, to manage their music these days? 
Yeah. And, and so there's, there's various sides to the challenges, right? Like we spoke about a minute ago. You know, you have your initial recording and your release side, which is your sound recording side, the traditional services that a record label would provide you. Now, there's a lot of services out there. They're called indie aggregators in, in our space. And an indie aggregator is really a technology partner for a creator to release that sound recording to the major DSP sources, the digital service providers, the iTunes, the iHearts, the Pandoras of the world. And these indie aggregators are companies like The Orchard, CD Baby, Believe. And what they are is, is low-cost platforms for you to integrate on a technological basis where you can upload your sound recordings. And those indie aggregators could get those sound recordings to those DSP sources so folks can listen to them in their subscription model. And you could get paid royalties for the reproduction and the public performance of your sound recording. Now, of course, there's a whole other side to the equation, which is the music publishing rights and the composition rights. Now... Uh, you could imagine in an environment where multiple folks write a, write a work together, uh, there's multiple uh, entitled parties there, they may be represented by various publishers and performing rights societies, or they themselves might actually be the music publisher. Now, a lot of folks who create indie music don't really understand that, that ecosystem, and so the things we're trying to do here at Music Reports is educate that community into understanding their own rights ecosystem. And so if you go to musicreports.com and sign up for an account, uh, and soon to be songdex.com, where there's going to be a whole bunch of tools for indie creators, you could register your works, you could claim works which are unmatched, and you could build out your song structure and your co-writers. Now, this I think is something that's been pretty mysterious to indie creators for you know the past 10 years uh, in the during the growth of the digital streaming uh, business. And so, you know, Music Reports aims to help that community by providing them just a deep knowledge base and uh, education and tools to disseminate that information help them collect their royalties for usage on, on digital service providers, and then help them with other challenges if they have internal challenges, such as accounting themselves, right? So if you think about a recording, that's actually a cover version. So if you record somebody else's work, you actually don't have the composition rights for that work, but you need to let someone know that it's a cover. And so Music Reports also provides tools to songwriters to rationalize that information so the money flows to the right places. And you brought up a very valid point, you know, if you don't own the song, obviously those those royalties need to go to that appropriate party or that appropriate entity. But then you have things like, you know, if it is your content, your original content, are you getting the monetization from, say, YouTube and from Amazon? You know, what about the sync licensing, not only for television and film, but for games and, you know, your music streaming? Because it's it's not... It's not just worldwide distribution. It's it's also uh, you know the publishing royalty collection is really. I mean that's there's a lot of moving parts here. I think that's definitely the biggest challenge for the DIY and indie community now. And I think it's just from the perspective of of education, right? So it's very sort of cut and dry to record music and release it. Uh, and those indie aggregators provide that function for the indie music. Uh, creator community. But the other side of that is is very complicated. Uh, who wrote the music? Who controls it from a public performance perspective, from a mechanicals perspective? Who controls the sync rights? And these may be terms that are very unfamiliar to a creator, right? I'm a musician. I make music. I really don't understand these things. I just want to get paid for my creation. And so, yeah, there has to be a lot of education out there. And, that, and that's really what Music Reports is aiming to do, to get folks to enter that information. We have a, a, a manual research group here, 50 folks that just interacts with that community manually on a daily basis to help them understand these terms so that they can collect the information properly and enter it into our system and then we'll disseminate that information to the world at large so folks know who to pay uh, and to the extent that a digital service provider or an audiovisual streamer uses music reports as a service provider we have all that information and we can make sure that money flows properly. So we really sit in between, you know, those large pools of sound recording usage and the corresponding music publishing royalties that are owed for the folks who created the actual composition. How are you in comparison or in relation to, say, the Harry Fox Agency out of New York? Yeah, so the Harry Fox Agency is a, you know, existed for approximately 100 years. And the Harry Fox Agency was initially a mechanicals collective society um, where if you were a music publisher, you could become a member of the Harry Fox Agency and they would, uh, you know, go to each of the, the sales and distribution sources of your music and collect that music publishing royalty. 
you know, historically that was related to physical product only. Um, now Harry Fox Agency has, has become a little bit more like Music Reports from the perspective of providing services to, to digital service providers and liquidating mechanical royalties on their behalf. So there are some similarities, but I do believe uh, from the perspective of a membership organization, which Music Reports is not, there's, there's some differences as well. So Music Reports does not necessarily represent any rights in particular. Uh, we provide technology so that big users of music can create fluidity in the marketplace for licensing that music and paying the royalties as opposed to us representing any of the creators themselves and you know going around the world demanding royalties on their behalf. Uh, we're more of a, a platform to uh, pass royalties through and provide financial technology. That brings up the perspective of today's independent artists, that, that DIY singer, songwriter, performer, they really need to understand, they need to understand how to control really all of the dynamics and, and the platforms, whether they're horizontal or they're vertical, what it takes to run their career. And I, it sounds to me that that's really what music reports can help provide them yeah i think that's a really good distinction bob um so music reports is is providing services for all types of rights on a global basis so it's not limited to the u.s uh, and it's not limited to the mechanical reproduction of a composition it's public performance it's sync it's grand rights uh, for theatrical performances it's audiovisual rights uh, it's sound recording rights as well. And so we really run the gambit of, of a full rights collective uh, and payment infrastructure. I want, I want to ask you a question uh, before we take a break in regards to worldwide distribution. I have run into this problem in the past with some artists that I've worked with. We're collecting the royalties from the United States, from Canada, from most of the countries in, in Europe. And then, of course, we start getting into some third world countries, maybe some some Eastern Bloc, maybe some South American. Uh, but especially when you get over into, you know, the Pacific Rim, say the Philippines, it seems like it's a struggle to get valid reports and honest to goodness uh, royalty distribution statements. Is, is that seem to still be an ongoing battle? Yeah, look, I think it's getting better. And I think, you know, the APAC territories, like you mentioned, and, and, and some of them in particular are really budding copyright uh, territories where they're really just trying to figure out uh, how to deal with the digital ecosystem. Now, many of these local societies outside the U.S. are very old companies, and they did things for a very long time in a very particular way. Now, one thing to understand uh, to, to make this, this ecosystem even more complex than, than we've already framed it is that the rights implications and the way you pay for rights and license rights is different from territory to territory. Now the US is probably the most complex territory where you have to identify each rights holder independently, license them independently and pay them directly. Outside the U.S., you have territorial collective management organizations or performing rights societies that generally offer you a blanket license, and if you operate in their territory locally, you pay them for the royalties, and you give them a big old usage file, and you hope that they could identify the proper rights holders, and if those rights holders exist outside of that territory, meaning, let's say, a U.S. creator being performed in the U.K., you have to wait for all those royalties to flow from society to society to music publisher to creator and of course you know everybody takes their piece along the way and so transparency has certainly been a challenge historically in this space and as the volume in digital grows transparency is of course something that's on everybody's mind and it's something that 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 really needs to be solved and it's something that music reports absolutely aims to solve you know, securing and, and administering direct licenses on a global basis for creators. And so, you know, where traditionally royalties may touch multiple societies before they got to you, if they got to you, uh, music reports will secure direct licenses uh, and ensure that you have a direct relationship with the user of your creation. And that's something that, you know, the, the singer songwriter, the owner of the property needs to understand. Uh, that when you get your music out there, you don't want to let anything slip through the cracks, especially with what the monetary return is. You need to collect every two-tenth of one cent that you can these days. That, that's absolutely right, because those do stack up, and the, it is the way the business is currently 
you know, managed. A royalty rate on a large digital service provider could be, you know, one thousandth of a penny at this point. And you're really counting on the volume, the billions of streams that take place. And I think it's becoming increasingly more important for indie creators to understand the representatives that they need, to understand the rights that they need to represent uh, for their creations on, on all sides of it. When we come back, I want to talk about how today's independent artist really needs to be educated on you know, music copyright licensing, royalties, et cetera, which is something I believe your company can offer, and how this data is being used to empower the entire entertainment and industry. This is Bob Bender. Uh, we're in the studio with Michael Shanley, Vice President and Head of Business Development at Music Reports, and you're listening to this edition of The Business Side of Music. Hi, we're Rockland Road. And you're listening to The Business Side of Music with Bob Bender. You're listening to the business side of music. Next up, the Indie Artist Spotlight, brought to you by Reverb Nation. This is Donna Herrick from the band Herrick, and we're members of Reverb Nation. Hundreds of shows a year have created our unique sound that you can hear on the new album, Cotton Fields. Go to Reverb Nation, listen and download now. This is Donna Herrick from the band Herrick, and we're members of Reverb Nation. When I was a little bit of baby, my mama would rock This is Bob Bender. We're in the studio today with Michael Shanley, VP and Head of Business Development at Music Reports, talking about distribution, songwriting, royalties, copyrights, licensing. You know, that's one of the things, Michael, that when I first started in the record business, I had no concept of licensing or royalties and especially when you had, you know, maybe multiple songwriters or publishers, the song splits. My education was through um, the baptism of fire, I guess you could say. Uh, a lot of artists, though, don't have that luxury. They really need to know what they're doing from the moment they set foot on the ground and get running. Yeah, look, I think it's the biggest problem that plagues the, the, the modern day music business, especially in the in the digital space. Um, it's understanding your rights and and like you uh, all of these terms and as a lifelong musician all of these terms and right types and and representation types were alien to me until I worked on this side of the business and you know that that's a big problem uh, when you had these traditional record labels and music publishers collecting your royalties for you they were experts at this and so they could do it on your behalf and now as an indie creator or a singer-songwriter uh, or an indie artist you really need to understand these things for yourself uh, so that you could track down all your various types of rights and so I think there's, there's a lot of talk right now about the technology in the music space being part of, of the solution that, that, that needs to take place. But, you know, I would argue that before we talk about technological solutions, which there's plenty out there that, that are ample to deal with the volume, you have to talk about the education and the metadata, right? If there is no metadata related to who created a work, no one's going to get paid for it, no matter what technology you use, whether it's a blockchain technology. That, that's, or that's right. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's so important that the creator of this content, whether this is their first project or it's their 10th project or their 100th project, as you said, there were there's 30,000 pieces of content being released every day. You know, there's enough people out there listening to music or watching a TV show or viewing a film that your music as that creator might be on there. Uh, you're not doing this for free. I, I, I know, you know, people that get in this business uh, because they love it and it's passionate. Uh, it's very passionate for them. And, and that's, you don't ever want to lose that passion. But at the same time, don't forget to pick up the check at the end of the day. And they need to be educated on those 
topics of how they can do that. That's right. And I think, you know, the problem related to metadata relating to who owns composition rights and the various right types embodied in a composition, it's not an aversion to, to dealing with the problem. I think it's just a lack of information as per what the challenge is and what the data is that's required. I think a lot of indie creators, when they release sound recording through their indie aggregator, they, they believe that they've entered enough information to get all the royalties paid to them. Uh, but the problem is that's just simply not true uh, because there's a whole corresponding ecosystem on the other side of that intellectual piece of property where they need to curate that metadata. And that's who wrote the work, who recorded the work, who wrote the music, who wrote the lyrics, who are your representatives from a music publishing perspective, and who are your representatives from a public performance perspective. Let me ask you this. Um, the, the technology that has been created that is now out there that is affording all of these opportunities, is the industry catching up to it? Are, are they using the technology to their fullest extent? And let me preface that by saying, and I've shared this story many podcasts previous to this, that back in the day, and I want to say right around 98, 99, maybe 2000, as a record label exec, we stopped looking at singles. We were just looking at the full 10, 11, 12 cut CD as our viable source of revenue because that's how we we did business. Uh, when iTunes came along and really kind of saved, well, I shouldn't say kind of, when iTunes came along and they really saved the business, the industry, uh, from the the music pirates out there, the the Napsters, the the Kazaz and the Morpheus, has the technology has it surpassed what we understand or are we catching up to it or is it kind of equal footing now in that, you know, we know what's out there, we know how to use it and we're using it at 100 percent or are we still trying to catch up? Yeah, well, you know, I would say that there's a there's great tech and ample tech to deal with these challenges and, and music reports, you know, applies a, a lot of modern day tech to solve these problems and of course our systems continuously evolve as as the technology industry evolves i think probably part of the problem is that it's not holistic from the perspective of everybody hasn't adopted the, the, the ample technology to deal with the challenges they face in their particular territories. Uh, and I think when you have folks who are using older systems in certain territories, you have less transparency, you have slower moving payments or potentially you know, not moving payments at all. Um, and, and there's a lot of stories that you hear these days where if you are owed royalties for audiovisual broadcast or even digital streaming, you may not see that for years. And that just doesn't make sense from a modern day technological standpoint. And those are the problems that Music Reports, you know, uh, poses to, to, to solve with its modern day technology stack. And, and, and I think we do apply some really cool tools to get that done. And especially when you consider now that the transference of funds is something that can be done in the matter of minutes, you know, if not hours. It's not taking days to do that anymore. Uh, we are living in pretty much of a hyperspeed technology from that aspect. I, I know that, you know, back in the days when we first started using digital aggregators, to get our, our projects, our, our music out there in, into the public forum, we were, you know, we, we would sometimes wait a, a week to 10 days to two weeks. And then I would notice that we would not really get up-to-date reports. You know, sometimes we would get information that was maybe, it was somewhat dated. It could be two weeks or 30 days or 45 days dated. Uh, we're not seeing that much anymore, are we? Well, you know, th there's also, you know, royalty structures that take place on a monthly basis. Now, of course, all the modern day streaming technology that's out there tracks usage on a per usage basis, right? And so that's billions of transactions on a daily basis. And Music Reports clients interface with our backend systems to track all of the composition rights that are embodied in that real time usage. Um, but yeah, I think that, um, you know, there are modern day systems to track everything at this point and to pay royalties in a very contemporary way. Uh, and I think everybody just really has to adopt that modern day technology. So Michael, how can today's independent artists, how can they find you? 
I we've we've given you uh, given the website. Is that the best way? Yeah. So I, look, I think if you're an independent creator, you should engage musicreports.com and register for an account if you already haven't registered for one. In musicreports.com, there's a whole bunch of tools for indie creators to use. Uh, registration tools so you could register your music and make sure the the, the music users of the world have that information. Um, there's claiming systems to identify sound recordings that may have been released through your indie aggregator so you could build out that composition level data. Uh, and I think you should also, uh, and in musicreports.com, you could also get paid and see the activity that's taking place on digital service providers platforms uh, on a monthly basis. So there's a lot of real time and contemporary information there. There's full transparency, so all the sound recordings that are used. And I should say, just related to your, to your previous question, there's a big matching problem, right? And so if you think about the data coming from two different sources, you have your sound recording release coming in from the indie aggregators, if you will, or the record labels, and then you have this music publishing data related to the composition that's coming in from various music publishers. So if you co-wrote a work with four other folks, there may be four different sources of that data related to just the composition and one source for the sound recording. Now, you have to take all that metadata on, a, on an always-on basis and attempt to match it. Uh, you could use syntax, you could use ID matching, but I think that's the general challenge. And the biggest problem is if that composition metadata didn't come in from the music publishers or from the creators themselves, it's not going to match, right? And so you're going to have a sound recording that's out there with no related music publishing uh, rights information. And so through musicreports.com, you could see all that. You could see where there's missing information. You could input that information. You could claim sound recordings that you've created. Uh, and through songdex.com, uh, there's going to be a whole bunch of, of indie tools to help you as an indie creator disseminate that metadata globally to any source that you decide needs to get that data, to any source that may be using that metadata to help you account internally. And so songdex.com is going to have a whole bunch of those tools come the end of the summer. And it's up right now. I think everybody should check it out so you could research your works, uh, get a view into the Songdex database. But yeah, come and register for a free account at musicreports.com. Music Reports doesn't commission any royalties that flow through the system. We do not charge any amounts to register your information or disseminate that data to the DSPs that are on the platform. Michael, a wealth of information. I'm, I'm glad we were able to connect. I hope that a uh, a lot of our listeners out there take advantage of music reports and song decks. Michael, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Bob. If you're interested in learning more about our show, drop us a line at musicpodcast at mail.com. That's musicpodcast at M-A-I-L dot com. If you have any suggestions of persons or topics that involve some facet of the music industry that you'd like to hear about on our podcast, please feel free to let us know. You can follow us on Facebook on the Business Side of Music podcast page. You can also find us on Twitter at Music Business Podcast. Also, if you're listening to this podcast on iTunes, post a review on what you think of our show. This is Bob Bender, and you've been listening to this edition of the Business Side of Music. The Business Side of Music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender. Co-producer for the show is Vinny Rivas. The Business Side of Music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Los Angeles, California and Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Buson.